Welcome back to Dare to Leap. I have the amazing Heather Hubbard here with us today. Heather is the founder of Simple Courage, a storytelling media company, movement, and community. Woohoo! I love a movement. And what is her mission? To take down the patriarchy through one small but defiant act of courage each day. And if you're not watching this on YouTube, you might want to go over there, number one, because uh, Heather is a beautiful, vibrant woman and because she is making faces and muscles. <laughs> <laughs> she is she is very animated, which I love. Um, prior to starting her own company, she was a prominent and award-winning attorney and manager at one of the largest law firms in the U.S., and she has been featured in tons of top media, including Forbes, NBC, Business Insider, and more. And I am so proud to call Heather a friend and a colleague. We've had the privilege of getting to mastermind together in, in person. And I will tell you that Heather is brilliant and hilarious. So welcome, Heather. Oh, wow. Now I have to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> you're just naturally that way <laughs> thanks for having you don't, have me. To, <laughs> you don't have to be anything other than who you are because you're amazing as you know uh, well that's fabulous so Heather do you still live in Nashville Tennessee yes I am in Nashville and just basically stay at home all the time and are you from that area originally no I grew up in a really small rural town in Kentucky and it's only four hours away from here but I only visit once a year for Christmas and hmm. this past year um, was the first year I did not even do that obviously because of COVID. Yeah so um, you your background is just so gorgeous and and your red hair is just popping so um if you're listening to the audio, feel free to swing over to YouTube and check it out because you won't be sad that you did. So, you know, Heather, as we are getting started here, one of the things that always popped out for me for you is that you were an attorney. How long were you an attorney? How long did you practice? Oh, it was for, it was over a decade. Um, that was a trick question. I'm like, now you're making me do math. It was over a decade. Can we go with that? Let's get the calculator out. Oh yes, gosh. we can definitely go with over a decade. Sorry. Math, I didn't mean to, to throw. My, you know, math's not my strongest skill. When you take the year you were born and add, no, I'm kidding. Okay. So that's a long time to be an attorney, a decade. That's a long time. And then yeah. what happened? What made you change and what did you go into instead? Yeah, I mean, so I was doing really well and I was one of the only women that was in management that was, you know, a partner. I was climbing the ladder and I, there was just a part of me that felt like there was more, that there was something more that I was supposed to be doing. And so I had this one year in particular I, it was just, I was getting ready to cuss. Are we allowed to cuss on this, Kathy? I you can cuss. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, you know, you can show. cuss. It's a podcast. Okay, you can well, say anything. Look, I just try to respect <laughs> people's, you know, communities and their places. So, yeah. So it was, it was a complete shit show, kind of like 2020. Um, but in that case, it was just personally, there was just one thing after another that was going wrong, but I held it all together and never acted like anything was wrong and continued, you know, to just put on that strong face. Um, and no one at work, no one in my friends, like no one knew what was going on. And I, I just had this breaking moment where I was like, okay, I have to make sure that I'm living life on purpose. So, um, I should probably mention this. So at the end of that year, like that was the shit show, my younger sister died in a car wreck. And that made me reflect oh gosh, on what am I doing with my life, right? If life oh, is this wow. short, am I living it the way that I want to be living it? And then that led me on a multi-year journey of trying to do some self, personal self-development, growth. I, you know, I tried anything and everything. I was just trying to 
I needed something to center me. And I finally, I know this is a long answer. I finally. Ended no, up, no, this is exactly what I want to know. Okay. So I finally end up on, a, it was a two week vacation to Tanzania. So we went on a safari, which I had always wanted to do. I had not taken a single day off in 10 years as a, like wow. as a lawyer, I had not. No taken. way. You worked as a lawyer for a decade and did not take a vacation. Yeah. Cause that was, yes. So that was 10 years. Okay. Yeah. So 10 years in, I had never taken a day, like I would take vacations, but I was always available. And as uh, my I family see. or yeah. friends or Working anyone vacation. else knew, you know, I mean, I remember being in New York once when my husband's asleep in the bed and I literally am doing a deposition. It's, so it was a telephone deposition and I'm like having to tell him to like be quiet in the background because otherwise I was going to have to not do the vacation at all because clients are just so demanding. And in my mind, it was like, I always had to say yes. I always had to be available. So taking that vacation did not seem possible to me. That may seem normal for other people, but like I thought... I would lose my job. I would lose all my clients. Uh, you know, basically I would have to rebuild my entire career if I took two weeks off. Wow. Um, you were, you were really over delivering and you weren't feeling your worth, were you? <laughs> bingo. So obviously what happens when you actually go do that and then, and maybe it's different now, but when we were, but I doubt it, you know, we're on the Serengeti and there's no Wi-Fi. There's no cell service. So I truly had to unplug. Even, you know, it didn't matter what I wanted. And when I was there, when I created that, when there was some space between my crazy mind and what I thought was reality and actually experiencing true reality, I had enough of a, of a place to say, I came here on this earth. Um to do big things. And by that, I mean like my, my own version of big things. I always wanted to speak. I always wanted to have a microphone. I always wanted to lead in a different way, not just in that professional setting. I used to think I was going to go into politics and I was just like, I'm doing big, important stuff. I'm making a difference, but I don't know that this is my path. And for the very first time I gave myself permission to wonder, well, what might that path look like? So that really was the pivotal moment because I actually enjoyed being a lawyer. Um, but there was something else. And so that's one of the things I often tell people, just because you're great at something doesn't mean you have to do it. And just because others need and want you to do something doesn't mean you have to continue to do it. And so that really was the pivotal moment for me. It was on the Serengeti no cell service, space between all the crazy things I had made up in my head and reality. And so that's within 10 months, I left and started my own company without a business plan or anything else. I just knew I had to do it. I had to try it and I'd figure the rest out as like, I'd figure it out as I go. Yeah, that's pretty much what I did too. <laughs> Except for I didn't go to Serengeti. Us, right? <laughs> it worked out fine. Yeah. Yeah. So yesterday, somebody, I was talking to somebody and they're like, so how did you plan out what you were going to do? And I'm like, oh, I, I flew by the state of my pants <laughs> and I really enjoy it. <laughs> and I'm kind of bummed that really now I, I can't fly by the seat of my pants so much anymore. But what I'm, what I'm planning on doing is getting everybody else on my team to not fly by the seat of their pants. They can have all those plans and everything they enjoy. And then I'll be free to fly by the seat of my pants. You know? Yes. Well, the funny thing is I'm actually very much a, like I'm a planner. I'm super strategic. I like it all mapped out, but I have to know what I need and want. And like there, there has to be enough play period, kind of like what you were saying, creative yes. period. Yes. And then you drill down. Um, if you create right. plans without really knowing what's going to light you up, what you're, what, what's going to light your market up. Like mm -hmm. you really shouldn't be planning that much. In my opinion, it's better to just take action, trial and error, oh, test yeah. it out. Oh yes. Right. And then mm -hmm. you get those plans and that like really strong strategy in place. I think there's a time and place for both. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, my, you know, I always think what is your number one goal right now? What's your number one goal right now? 
for me, my number one goal was make money. I wanted to make some income. So instead of doing all the planning and stuff, I was just like, exactly what do I need to do to start making money? And I did that. And then I went, do I like it? Because that was my goal is I'm never going to do anything I don't enjoy again. Yes, I like it. Okay, now I'm going to plan because I'm making some money so that I can relax a little bit. But not everybody needs it. Not everybody needs to make that money. That was just what I needed. Yeah. So when you made that choice to leave, what did you feel like you needed? What did you want to have happen? And what did happen? So I, I literally gave myself a year. My, I gave myself permission to take a year to just be creative, play and figure it out. I'm an Fabulous. all in kind of girl. So <laughs> I knew. Yeah, we noticed with the 10 years of no vacation. <laughs> Were you really unplugged? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm told. Yes. I am an all in kind of girl. And, um, I knew that because a lot of people can have side hustles and, and slowly move into something that's not me and my right. personality. And I me knew either. that I would not, I didn't, I didn't want to be, because I was, I was a manager in my firm. I was a partner. I had a bunch of clients. I wanted, I, I didn't want to do both at the same time. So I gave notice and quit and had nothing. You know what I mean? I was like, I, but I had confidence in myself that I could figure it out as I go. So literally I left saying, okay, we're going to start a business and we're just going to start putting things out there. So what I did was, um, the, the week after I left, I emailed everyone I knew and I had a pretty big, pretty big network because I had always been a national um, attorney, like the type of law I did was federal. So I knew people all over and I get, I'm, I get to know people. So I had a ton of contacts and I literally just emailed anyone and everyone, sent LinkedIn messages to every connection I had and said, hey, I just wanted to give you an update. I just left my law firm. I am starting my own personal and professional development company and um if you have anyone that you know that needs any kind of speaking, coaching, anything related to, you know, um, career goals, I mean, who knows what I said? Like it was really broad, right? Like it was not specific. It was not niche. Um, if you need like, any help doing anything professional, yeah, I'm yours. Send them like, cause they know me. So I'm like, just send them my way. And by the way, here's a link to get on my newsletter, which will be coming out soon. And Kathy, like, I, I can't even remember what, this was 2014. So there was some, there was something, things weren't quite the same back then. I found something though, YouTubed it, figured out how do you, cause I wasn't techie. How do you get up a landing page with a newsletter list related to MailChimp? That was as far as I got. And just with that, yeah. I had 200 people sign up for a newsletter that I didn't even know what Fabulous. I was going to be saying or sending out. And so then I was like, okay, we've got 200 people. What are we going to say to them? We've got to do something, you know, we should probably make money. So then I was like, well, I love meditation and mindfulness. Let's play with that. So locally I said, okay, um, I'm going to do meditation and mindfulness. If anyone wants to come over to my house for a four week program, I didn't know what the program was going to be. And I had 10 women come over and they would come sit in my I love it. Wednesday and I would teach them, like, I would just do it as I would go. And they get, you know, and then I was like, okay, but what am I going to do with this email list? So then I was like, everybody always wants to know how I achieve so much. So I right. said, again, this was like online wasn't as big. I don't know that was zoom going on at 2014. So I said, um, and again, I didn't know what I was doing. So I was like, I sent an email that said, I'm going to do, it was telephone. Do you remember back? Like, I don't know. Like, but, uh, oh, that's how I started my training program was yeah, yeah. via telephone. Yeah. Yes. So I was like, we're going to have a teleseminar and yep. I'm going to share how I plan for uh, the year and achieve so many, this was December, achieve so many goals. And people, like people signed up for, and I was like, all right, so now, okay, so I don't know how to do this teleseminar. So then I tell them my story. I give them some tips. I'm like, and if you need more help, we're, we're going to do in January, we're going to, it's going to be called goals reimagined. And I'm going to help you with your goals for the whole month. I didn't know what I was going to teach them, right? <laughs> but I figured it out and they showed up and that's literally how it got started. And I continued to play with all kinds of concepts from online courses, telephone courses, 
um, in-person workshops for lawyers for what's called CLE. Um, I played with Facebook ads. I did retreats. I mean, I just did anything and everything. Um, and it resonated with a lot of people. So really long story long. Um, I ended up with a podcast called Hustle and Flow, and it was that generic because it was literally, I would talk about any and all topics related to hustle, which was succeeding in your business and your career and flow, mindfulness, meditation, all of that. And so I somehow was able I to- I love that. Yeah. I, was I love that name and I love that top, those topics. Yeah. So that's, that's what I did for, it was six years a few weeks ago. Wow. Can you believe it's been six years? No, because when you said a decade is a long time for a lawyer, I was like, I've like, we're getting close to being a decade as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. It's exciting. I love being And an now I know another reason. And now I know another reason why you and I hit it off so well, because how you described how you built your business, this is exactly how I did mine. I literally would, I literally got people signed up, paid to take my VA training program, got on a teleseminar with them and just talked about what I did to grow my own business. Yeah. We sometimes make it so difficult. We think that we have to have it fully mapped out and it has to be because we've been mm -hmm. in other stuff that looks really nice. And we're like, I have to have it polished mm -hmm. and recorded and mm -hmm. I have to know. And the truth is, if you are an expert, people just want your expertise. That's right. And you think, oh, everybody knows this, but they don't. They don't. So they just want you to show up and help them. Like, it's really right. that simple. Yeah. And mine was 12 years ago when I started this. And two of the women, I had four women in that first class. And two of them are still with me. And they love to talk about, yeah, we were just on those teleseminars. You just brrr, talk. Brrr. We were taking notes as fast as we could. And our businesses took off because we did what you said. And here we are 12 years later, proof yes. that you don't have to have it all polished. I literally would then transcribe those lessons. And that's what I did for my next uh, lessons. My next program was I had those yes. and then I could, you know, do a little bit better. Yes. And thank goodness we didn't have it polished to begin with, because I don't know about you, but I learned a lot and I continually oh, yeah. improve and reiterate like and iterate right. and had it been polished from day one, it, you know what I mean? Like I probably wouldn't have gone. You would have wasted a lot of time in the beginning yes. without making any money and moving forward. Yes. Yeah. To me, this is the way to take action, 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 action. Yeah. Yes. I love that. Yeah. So what lesson, well, let me just take one step back. So when you decided to leave your law firm and start your own business, how did you have the courage to do that? Is that just something that you were born with and this level of confidence that you have, was that just something you were born with or have you developed it? I love this question because it is so part of the Simple Courage brand, um, which is the new business. Ooh, well. um, yeah. So... In many ways, I am fearless. Um, when it comes to the belief in myself that I can accomplish whatever I want, figure out what I want, um, that, I mean, it truly is, I was born that way. I am fearless. I say what's on my mind and I'm generally not scared. That said, I have a ton of fears. They just look different. Um, Spiders? Well, no, but no, but for example, like I'm afraid of disappointing people. I'm afraid uh, of uh, not being good enough. Right. So I might have confidence mm. in myself, but I'm also afraid that maybe it's, maybe I'm overly confident. Right. Um, I'm afraid that, um, people won't like me. I'm afraid of saying mm. no. I mean, I made a ton of progress on all of this stuff, but, um, there, so Heather, do you think fears. those are women's issues? Those are women's challenges? Because I don't know any men who say, I'm afraid of disappointing people. I'm afraid of <laughs> not, you know, whatever those things were you just said. I don't know any man that has said those. Yeah. Well, I have all kinds of thoughts um, that are coming to me. <laughs> mm. So mm -hmm. I, I think, I do think that it shows up. Maybe it shows, hmm. 
I'm just going to think aloud here. I think it shows up Good. for women more than men. That said, I wonder if it just shows up differently or we talk about it and they don't. And so a, a really good example of this is as I was trying to build my courage muscles around disappointing people, um, I decided that maybe for Thanksgiving, this goes back to that small rural town, and my husband and I are from the same small town. We're the only two who's ever left, like ever. Oh, families. wow. And um, – I remember the first time I suggested that we not go in for Thanksgiving and instead we go to Cabo. And who <laughs> would have thought that I told him, Hey honey, why don't we, why don't we for shits and giggles, like go up in an airplane and jump out without an air, like, without any kind of parachute <laughs> and see what happens. And the reason why that was like death defying for him was because he was so worried about what his parents and his family would think about him. Oh, which wow. is a fear of disappointing people, but I don't think yes, that it that's is. how men, they don't, they don't come out and say that, right? They're just like, we can't do that. You know what I mean? And so I don't right. know. I think women, I think men do have that. It's just maybe it's sometimes in a different context and maybe they use language that looks different or the other thing I think men do like women, like we'll talk it out. We think about it. We say these things right. and Men will, um, I'm going to be a little stereotypical here, but, mm -hmm. um, men will just not deal with it or they'll lie about it. Right. That's what I think too. That part is what like I they'll agree with just you. Just lie about it. Right. Yeah. So maybe they don't go in for, th I'm, ma I'm making something up here, but maybe they don't go in for Thanksgiving, but like, they don't say they're going to Cabo and then they don't put photos <laughs> up. You know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, I do. I know. But I do think yeah. that, I think that stuff is there. Um, and this is where, right with the intro, you're talking about taking down the patriarchy. For me, the mm -hmm. patriarchy is, affects not only women, but men as well, because they do oh, think that they have to I have never thought of that. Roles, right? Like they have to show up a certain way. So a lot of times I think they're not speaking up on behalf of women or, um, pe you know, people of color or other things like that because – they're like that. Well, that's not appropriate. You know what I mean? They're worried about mm -hmm. how they'll yep. be perceived. They're worried about being kicked out of the club. Um, it's easier yep. for them to just go along. So when we empower them to also be true to themselves mm -hmm. and to have radical honesty, mm -hmm. honestly, they can do more about the patriarchy than we can. So I'm, I really think we have to bring them all in, but they're a pain in the ass. So I don't want them all in at the same time. We got to like trickle them in because I can't. <laughs> I just well, can't, I, right? I, I will say that for my husband, he has none of those things that you just said that your husband had all those feelings and stuff. Um, but I do agree with you that it's not because he doesn't have those feelings inside. It's because he has been taught to hide all of his feelings yeah. and never show any right. of that. And instead, right. I think what he, I, I feel what he does is, I think he internalizes it. I think he's lost happy because of it. Yes. And he is angry because of it. Yes. Resent, resentment and anger. Resentful. Yeah. Yes. Right. I agree 100%. So talk a little bit more about what it means then to take down the patriarchy. big topic and why you want to do that yeah so I you know the funny thing is um this goes back to like just when you know when you're born when I was born um as a little girl it like it just never I it there were a lot of things that didn't make sense to me I would be like why why is it this way I was also raised Southern Baptist, and so I often would ask these same questions of the preacher and the Sunday school teacher, which my parents didn't appreciate. But <laughs> I just always was like, ah, but why? Or that doesn't make sense. I would say, well, that doesn't make sense. Um, and, you know, they would try to, to do the societal conditioning, right? Like to be like, but this is why. And I would be like, I'm not buying it. That was not a good argument. So clearly, right. I was, I was meant to be a lawyer. At least <laughs> you were, initially. yes, no joke. That's not a good argument. <laughs> I was like that. I'm, you did not convince me. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah. And this is part of why, you know, I don't even go back to my small town. It was a, 
it felt a bit traumatizing in just how sexist and racist and homophobic it was. And I recall like always speak, like even as a child and going through school, I would have really strong opinions that were not um, the norm, but I was never afraid to have those opinions, but they were just like, to me, it was just, I don't know why I looked at the world a little bit differently but I, I think it was because I questioned things. And I would be like, well, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, and so- Heather, I think maybe, and here's an outside perspective. Yeah. Um, I think you're like super smart, like incredibly off the charts smart. And perhaps that's why you question things because you saw more, you understood more than most people do at that age and, and as you go through it. I appreciate that. I don't ever consider myself to be super smart, but I bet um, you hear it all the time though. But I just feel like I'm, uh, <laughs> there are some really intelligent intellectual people that like I spend time with and I'm like, boring. <laughs> like I'm not an intellectual. I'm not an you intellectual. You don't have to be, you don't have to be boring to be super smart. In fact, I think super smart people are the most interesting people. Well, I will take that then. So whether yeah. it was super smart or something else, um, I just saw things differently, but I didn't really understand why until, or to even start to understand why until I went to college. And so when I was in college, I had my first, um, so I was a history major and a political science major, and I had my first women's history class and my first black history class. And wow. I was trying to think was that of what they called it, but they called it black history. Um, and both of those blew my mind because I had never learned any of the things they were talking about, which directly contradicted what I did learn growing up. Yes. Um, and it introduced me to scholars and movements and um, activists that I was like, this is what I have always been looking for, but I was never exposed to it. Um, and that's when I learned about the patriarchy. That's when I learned, oh, wow, this is a system. And that's what the patriarchy is, right? Like, it's not like there's some, like, there's a club and there's like 10 people in the room, right? Like, it's, it's, it's an, not a club it's, where there's a bunch of guys sitting around smoking and drinking whiskey. Right. So, I mean, it's not <laughs> like, you know, I mean, I feel like with some of this like QAnon stuff where like they think there's literal people, I'm like... I'm not talking about literal people meeting and having discussions, but right. over time, historically, the systems have been put in place and they continue to, they've become like a machine. And so they continue to grow and it comes in many different ways. It comes in through our government. It comes in through our education. It comes in through our churches in a huge way. And that's not to knock our churches, but they are so patriarchal. And so that's the starting point. And so when you want to then start to give people equal rights or give people equal platforms and start to question why, you know, we just have all these white men on our currency or things like that, right. you really are having to bring down an entire system. And um, for me, I guess, like I said, from the moment I was born, I've had a desire to question and take down this thing that was preventing me and others from being able to do things like this is going to be a really small example but when I was dating my husband we're high school sweethearts um Aww. my in-laws and this is nothing against them they have their own patriarchal you know their own societal programming I remember mm -hmm. it was all the women in the kitchen all the time. And that was in mine as well, right? Like the men were never in the kitchen. They never did anything. Anytime there was any kind mm -hmm. of gathering, Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever, the women were going to do all the work in the kitchen while the men sat down and watched football. And I, as a kid, would always be like, this is jacked up. And I would say that. I was like, what is, what, why, why is this? Mm -hmm. So um, I remembered when I was dating them and they were like trying to groom me into the family and they would be like, Heather, come help. Um, and I would be like, well, okay. His name is Mike. I'd be like, come on, Mike. And they'd be like, oh, Mike doesn't have to help. And I'm like, why does Mike not have to help? And they were like, mm -hmm. the men watch mm -hmm. football. And I'm like, I like football. And so mm -hmm. it started this whole thing of, you know, 
that was radical to them that I refused to come in and help in the kitchen unless Mike was coming in too. And I didn't care to help mm-hmm. as long as he was helping. Um, mm-hmm. And they couldn't handle him being in the kitchen. And so I didn't go in the kitchen. But that's what I mean mm-hmm. by, and that's just one tiny example. I mean, there are millions, right? So are we going right. to truly take down the, the patriarchy in this li- in this lifetime? Probably not, but let's sure as hell like chip away as much as we can for future generations. Um, I think we can make a huge difference, and I think it comes through being defiant, being courageous, even when it feels uncomfortable, even right when you're worried about the repercussions. And it's not easy. It's simple. It's not easy. Um, but that's what changes the world. That's what changes mm-hmm. the world. Mm-hmm. Um, another small example that I've seen and heard many times, and I do believe this is shifting with the uh, younger generations. Uh, I hope it is. Um, but my generation, when the husband, uh, the father of the child uh, took care of the child, he was helping out his wife in babysitting. So it wasn't really his responsibility and he was doing her a favor. He wasn't fathering. Right. He was helping. Right. So do you think that's shifting? I hope so. I mean, I have to say though, I feel like now that, um, given who I'm around, given that I live in like a really big city, I don't see too much of that, but I also can tell you, that when I talk to family back home or I see friends on Facebook back home, I'm not so sure. Right. I mean, I do think that things like, I do think things slowly take time. And obviously we had people come before us who were chipping away at that. Um, Right. But, you know, depending on where you live, depending on your family, depending on your community and the culture and the industry and all of that, um, those might still be, even if they're not radical ideas, and for some they are radical ideas, um, Mm -hmm. they're still not the norm. And you are, you're you're creating friction. And that can be scary. That can be scary. And And it can be uncomfortable. Yeah. And it's why a lot of us don't push it because we're like, it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Or I don't want, I mean, even in just my own, even in my own relationship with my husband, um, I have to cause a lot of friction to, to get change to happen, even in just the, the two of us, because my husband is 70, very set in his ways, very from all that old school stuff you're talking about and slowly, but we've been married 26 years. And slowly but surely, I have chipped away at all that to the point where he calls himself a house husband. He, it is his responsibility to do the dishes. I don't have to ask for anything. It is his, what he has, the role he has chosen to take on. Yeah. And that's all really good. And it's taken a while to get there. But there are still weird things like my office where I'm sitting right now. I'm, I live in a tiny house, so I have very little space. And behind that curtain is a humongous desk that is my husband's. I mean, it's huge. It's one of those old fashioned, great big, huge, you know, desks and wooden desks. And he uses it maybe one day a month. I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. Maybe one day a month. Is he even there? So I asked him, could we please get rid of that so I can have this whole space where I am 90% of my life? Oh, hell no. (laughs) That is his desk. And it is like a part, it is like a limb that I'm asking to chop off. But I, you know, I didn't give up. I kept talking with him. You know, I call it, I put my sales pitch together on, you know. (laughs) And guess what? We're getting rid of it. So how do we take down the patriarchy? Is that how we do it? Is it going to be that slow and painful? Or do you have bigger plans? I'm sorry. I just made that sound so negative. (laughs) No, but it's true. And I think that's why, I mean, so here's the deal. 
it does have to start individually and in our home, right? Like you do have to go small. At the same time, you have to go big. So often when I um, used to speak, I would speak to a lot of women's groups um, about leadership and we would talk about change and I would remind them of the history the history major in me would remind them of the history of what it looked like in law for women. And so I would talk about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I would talk about Sandra Day O'Connor and how they graduated top of their class, but could only get like, they would only let them be secretaries. Um, right. And we would talk about, okay, Hey guys, there were not partners in law firms until the eighties. Um, right. Like, and, wow. and then we would talk about, like the maternity leave and the types of jobs that women could have even when they were in law firms and why, um, and all of that. And the reason why women were finally allowed to practice as lawyers and to be partners in firms was because certain women sued them. Woo. And here's the thing when, and this still happens today, when you sue someone in an industry like that, you then become the devil and are going to have a hard time ever finding a job again, right? Like it is not, you know, lawyers sue people every day, but you sue each other that it's kind of, it's kind of like the secrets we keep in our families or our communities or Mm. our churches, right? Like we can talk about it internally, but don't you dare go share, you know, our dirty laundry with anyone else. And suddenly you're not the victim. You're the aggressor. You're the problem, right? Like, and then we have gaslighting. And so, but that's how change was affected. It was women who were courageous enough to go actually do something and change the law, change the legislation. And for many, many years, we've now had, um, you know, I guess 20, 30 year. Well, even, so then there was this point where women were half of the law school graduate classes. And 25 years later, they still weren't making a big, like they still weren't getting promoted. Right. And so, and the reason why though, is because we're now just like, for many of us, when I graduated law school, it was never a question of, can I get a job as a lawyer? It was never a question of, can I become a partner? And so I think in some ways we start to slow down progress because we're just so used to that and don't realize that we actually had to fight for it. Um, and so uh-huh. I think we're getting back to a place in time, and I think we're already starting to see it, where people are start to, ready to fight again, um, where people are ready to say, wait a minute, when we mm-hmm. just kind of go with the flow and we have these little conversations, yeah, they make a little bit of a difference, but not that big of a difference. And when you're trying to bring down a whole damn system, mm-hmm. it doesn't happen in individual conversations. So the individual conversations are still needed. They are necessary but we Mm -hmm. have to go after the much bigger things. And so what does that look like? Well, I certainly don't have all of those answers, but I know there are women out there. I know there are men out there who want change. And so it's how do you help them develop the courage to, to go do it, right? So what does that look like? Does that look like canvassing? Does that look like speaking out on social media? Does that look like taking a strong stance in your business? Does that look like turning away um, clients or calling out people related to conferences? Does that look like running for office, running for, right, like being in politics? Um, Does that look like um, actually going to a council meeting? Does that look like marching? What does that look like? And I think there are a ton of organizations that are, they've already got their stuff together. They just need people to step up. And so, and I think we all have our own way to contribute. So I'm not here to say, this is the the path that you need to take. Mm -hmm. But if you are not okay with the system we have, and if you are not okay with the way it treats others, right? Because you and I know this as white women, we don't have the same advantages, but we sure have a hell of a lot more than any person of color. And so if we're not okay with those systems, then what are we going to do to contribute? And how are we going to get uncomfortable and start showing up? And so that's what Simple Courage is about. It is about small acts. It can be small, but you need to take an act every single day that is 
actively chipping away at that. And so whether, you know, those are private conversations, but this goes back to what you and I were talking about at the very beginning, action, action. It's not planning. It's not reading. It's not listening to a podcast. It's not journaling. It's not going to a, a, a workshop. Those things are great. And I'm not saying don't do them, but if you never get around to taking action, I mean, that's, that's where the good stuff is. It's in the action. It's in that trial and error. It is in making mistakes, but putting yourself out there. And so to me, that really is what's going to bring down the patriarchy is when we all commit to getting uncomfortable each and every day. I'm uncomfortable each and every day. I must be doing something right. Hell yeah, you are. <laughs> you live simple courage, right? Like you totally live and embody simple courage. And I know that Aww, everyone I hope in your so. community knows that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So in your business, Simple Courage, which you say is a storytelling media company, a movement and a community, who are you looking to join you in Simple Courage? Tell me the kind of people you're, if they're listening right now and going, oh, she's speaking to me. I'm interested in Simple Courage. Yeah. Anyone who wants to make a commitment to be uncomfortable to improve not only your own life but everyone else around you right so maybe you're like okay i don't know about taking down the whole patriarchy but i could actually use some of that in my own life in conversations with my husband or my clients great fine um and if you're like oh yeah i'm ready to take down the patriarchy too then come on in right there's room for all of us we all right we all have our own paths but if you feel as though you're not always truly um, authentic or true to yourself. And the reason why you're not is because of what other people expect of you, because of that societal conditioning, because you're worried or you're afraid. Um, if, if you want to speak out, if you want to speak up, but you're not sure how to do that, if, if you want to speak if you want to leave your corporate job and be an entrepreneur, um, if you if you want to be able to put on a telephonic seminar without knowing what you're doing, right? Like if you need, <laughs> if you're like, I just want to be more courageous, um, because I know that the rewards are going to be worth the discomfort. Then that's who this is for. Um, and part of why it's a storytelling media company is. I truly believe that this is not, this is not a formula. It's not a model. It is not a system. It is not a checklist. It is about learning to tap into your internal wisdom and trusting yourself, which the patriarchy does not want you to do. And mm. I don't know about you, but the way that I often if, am given hope and I'm inspired and I feel like, well, if they can do it, I can do it too. It's through hearing other people's stories right? It's hearing their oh, yeah. stories of courage, their stories of hope, yes. sharing their experiences. And so I, I come from this coaching educational, you know, background, but that's not what simple courage is. We're not going to tell you what to do. It's not about teaching, right? It's about creating a community and a movement that is sharing stories. And that could be your story from today. Right. Like you don't ha it does, that doesn't mean it's, it's something huge. But for some, it's 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 huge stories for others. It's this is this is what happened today with me. And yeah. I think that 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 is where that's where that's where the good stuff is. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why we're focusing on it in that way. And so it sounds like it's for uh, women, men, young, old. It is. It is. It's so funny because, right, like, I mean, I've got the marketing and sales background. And so I know, I know you, you do niche and you need all the <laughs> stuff. And so, yeah, like for purposes of at least, you know, and I'm happy to share this strategy for purposes of starting the company, because you got to start somewhere and then it's better to build out. We really are starting with the women who, well, one women, um, but the people who are always already kind of in my circle. So we're really marketing to um generally professional women um that might be let's say 35 to 55 right so that's who we're generally writing for 
that said, my vision for the company and the way that I want to grow it is that it truly is for everyone. And whether you are mm -hmm. 10 years old, right? Like whether you're like me, like you're 10 years old in that community where you're like, I'm different. I know I'm different. And how do I have these conversations mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. you are 95 years old and you always wanted to go tap dancing, but you're afraid, right? Like of what people will think mm -hmm. of you. Like it's for everybody. Yeah. It's for everybody. Because I do believe that the more we are true to who we are and what we really want to do that in and of itself, like that is radical. And that is exactly what the patriarchy does not want you to do. Because if you tap into that power and that courage, game over. So l let me, let me test this a little bit and see if I'm getting a good feel for this. So of course you want people who are already courageous like you are, who are, who are like gung ho are ready to do this, but you're also wanting those people who are like, yeah, I want more. I see there needs to be change. I don't know how to do it. Yeah. I'm not a huge risk taker right now. I don't have a ton of courage right now, but I am interested in learning yeah. how to have more. Well, is first that right? off, we're all courageous. Everyone is courageous. Okay. So that's the interesting. And everybody thing. feels like it. I don't always feel like it either. So people used to always say to me, oh, you're so courageous. You're so courageous. And I was like, am I? Um, because I have a lot of fears. <laughs> and so that's when I, I realized we all have fearlessness. I guarantee you that every single person listening or watching, there is something that they'll do where at least one per other person has been like, how do you do that? And maybe it's killing right. a spider. It doesn't matter. But you're like, well, why wouldn't I? Right? Um, right. And that means to that person, they're scared. So mm -hmm. to them, you are courageous in that moment. Right. And so there are also, so there's things where we're just fear, fearless. And because we don't need, we don't really, we don't really need courage because we're fearless. We sometimes discount that. Um, yes. But when it comes to being courageous, that even being true to yourself, you may never want to be as, you know, crazy as me with my red hair and, you know, big and bold. It's like, please, I don't want that. That's great. You don't have to. That's part of being true to yourself. If you tried right. to be me or if you tried to be someone that was much bigger and bolder when that's not who you are and you have no desire to be that, if you were trying to mm -hmm. be that, then you're falling right back into the patriarchal system of here's your role and here's why. So I actually right. think it's totally cool to be like, I don't know that I have any courage and I feel like if I went in there, I would be like the least courageous person. Oh, definitely come on in. Cause you've got some definite societal programming <laughs> there because right. Like yeah. that's what people, I guarantee you, you weren't born thinking that I guarantee you people told you that and you might be playing a role that you, you know, that you got very early on. We all play these roles. And we continue to play them. And so part of simple courage is starting to unpack and dismantle the person that everyone told you you are and to start to say, well, who am I? Who do I want to be? Like, who do I want to be? And I think that everyone, everyone comes from the same starting place with that. I don't know about you, but I very rarely meet someone who's not done any kind of personal development work who is like, oh, just yeah, I totally agree. In like, here's who I am, you know? Right. No. I, and for me, Heather, I believe, I truly believe um, that it's never ending Yes. because yeah, if, yes. if I stop trying to improve myself, I might as well just lay down and die. I mean, isn't that what this journey is about? Yeah. And the great thing is you get to choose it. So part of it's not even like discovering it it's just deciding it's like well who do I want to be today who do I want to be this week and that is radical that you could make the choice of who you want to be um it's also a lot of fun it can be scary but right like it can be fun like it is a lot of fun up. it's an I it's an a tiara every day what like, somebody might have done that already <laughs> me um so you know, and I, I love what you're just saying, because I am guilty 
of thinking um, of courage as these big things like Ellen Page, who came out as Elliot Page yep. recently. That to me is un- unbelievable courage. Yeah. But I think what you're also yeah. saying yeah. is yeah. don't compare your level of courage to others because yes. everybody has their own level and you can grow into whatever you want it to be or stay with the small steps. Yeah. I mean, it can be as simple as what. So one of the things that I was conditioned and you don't always know you're conditioned. That's the thing. Like we don't even know we're conditioned. So um, when I was in law school, they used to teach us etiquette and, you know, and I'm, I grew up in a family without any money, any connections. There was zero etiquette. Right. So I'm like, I'm trying to like just imposter syndrome. I'm trying to fake it till I make it. So I'm like showing up to the, here's how you have to dress and here's what you have to do. And you have to wear heels, but they can't be too high, but they can't be too short. So there are rules on the heels that you have to wear. And then I get into law and I'm at these professional conferences and sure enough, the women always wear heels and you're, you have to do that to look the part. And when you're speaking and you're on stage, you have to wear heels. And I was told that, but I never like sat and thought about it. Right. Fine. No big deal. So I go to give, um, a speech in February before the world shut down. And as I was packing, I was like, I saw my flats and I was like, Oh, wouldn't it be nice if I could wear my flats. And then I went, So one of the things I say with simple courage, you can often know when you're using false courage is when, or there's any kind of programming is when you're like, oh, but I can't ding, 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 ding. And I was like, oh, wait, why can I not wear flats on stage? Now in some industries, this would be perfectly normal, but in my industry, that is like, no. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, that could be my, and I was giving a simple courage speech. I was like, that that would really be living into this value so I was like can I do that so I pack those but I still pack the heels because I'm not really like that's how scared I was right like that's how scared I was I was like ah I don't really know if I this could be like career suicide so I love this so much which is ridiculous that you packed your heels but this I love it so I get the morning of I'm like getting dressed And I put the flats on and I'm like, can I do this? Can I do this? And I did it. And I have to tell you, I was scared at the end of the speech. I told the story of what happened that day. And I want you to know, like the women died because they were all walking around in their heels, but they had flats in their purses. Right. And they were, and they were all like, yeah, what are we doing? What are we doing? And so they then were getting their flats out and they're like, I'm wearing them the rest of the day. And others were like, I'm not brave enough to do that. Um, <laughs> another woman came up later. She was like, I have to say, when I saw you on stage with flats, I was like, oh, that is one brave woman. Right. So it's like, <laughs> because in our industry, like that really is like a faux pas. But mm-hmm. that's, I mean, how silly and small is that? Yeah. And yeah, no, I, I I totally agree with you. That's amazing. And look how you changed culture with that one little thing. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. And it's in your own brain, right? Because every time you give mm-hmm. yourself permission to break the pattern of mm-hmm. I have to, I have to, I have to, mm-hmm. it builds your muscles. And so what you think of as scary today, like you might be laughing mm-hmm. at next right. week. And so right. when you have that yeah. regular practice and you build on it, like who knows how courageous you might become, right? Like you, you just don't know. Um, but those little things, I love that free, you know? Yes. Yes. And I love that thought that you had of, if you're thinking, Ooh, what if I, or wouldn't it be great if I fill in the blank and stop yourself there and go, that could be my next courageous step. My small step I take today. Great tip. Yes. Well, Heather, we are going to have to wrap this up. So you've got me salivating over here, wanting to do more with Simple Courage. And I'm sure that our listeners are doing the same. So tell us how we can find out about how we can join up with you yeah, to participate just, in your Simple Courage movement. Just come on over to simplecourage.com. Check it out. You can get on the newsletter list, see what we've got going on. Um, you know, we just decided to go all in on this. So similar to six years ago, I'm in a playful stage. 
I am playing with several different concepts. And so when you come on over, you might see things that you won't see again, uh, you know, ever again. But Ooh. so I think this is the best time to kind of come in yeah. and get to see the beginnings and the playfulness. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll be able to see what's going on um, in the moment at simplecourage.com. So, and just let me tell everybody, if you think, wow, is Heather always like this? Yeah, and more. I, <laughs> I attended your summer camp um, this summer that you did virtually. I was so impressed with how playful that was. I got tons of great ideas from it. And so if you're listening to this and you're like, yeah, but all I'm really thinking about right now is wanting to grow my business. Well, guess what? Simple Courage is going to help you do that. If all you're really thinking about right now is, you know what, I've got to homeschool my kids for longer, that's okay. Simple Courage can help you with that too. So wherever you are right now, if Heather is speaking to you on even a small level, if she's piqued your interest, I highly recommend going to simplecourage.com. And Heather, thank you so much for talking with us today and sharing these amazing insights. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I love chatting with you. I could chat for hours with you um, and just love all the energy that you bring and the simple courage you bring to the world. So thanks for allowing me oh, into your you. life and on the podcast. Yeah. Bye, Heather. <laughs>